coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada, streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Telegram, Twitter, Twitch, Rumble, and Odyssey. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim, and today is the very first day. It is January 1st, 2023, and it is episode 229 of the workshop podcast. Happy friggin' New Year to you guys. I just finished up an incredible conversation with Jake Drum from Drum Emergency Solutions. He spent some time talking about emergency medicine in a completely different vein than I have ever heard taught before. We'll get into that in just a minute. Two things, guys. Number one, my goodness, I say this all the time, but don't I love the Telegram group. We've just spent so much time lately interacting with one another, helping each other out, sharing information, and of course, cracking jokes. It's growing quickly, but I love the group, the community we've built over there. So if you listen to me, if you watch me on YouTube, if you listen to me on the the audio podcast, and you're not on Telegram, do me a favor, give it a shot. Come by and join us because I love it there. It's awesome. But the main thing I wanted to talk about before we jump in is the resounding success of the workshop radio. Now, I need to say thank you to a ton of people. We had 21 content creators who were spotlighted and who provided content for the 24-hour live stream we did. Now, if you're crazy and you want to go back and listen to it, I made sure both episodes, both halves of the 24 hours were just under 12 hours, so they're archived on YouTube. If there's interest, I'll probably put out audio formats in the podcast feed as well. But it was so much fun, guys. We basically, you know, I said it was the background noise while getting shit done. So people jumped in and out of the chat room all the time. I think we had something like 900 chat messages. But it was just fun because people got exposed to so many other freedom-loving content creators. So thank you for helping that happen. It was loved so much and enjoyed so much that I think, no, sorry, I know that it's going to become a regular thing. How regular? I'm not sure yet. What form it's going to take? I don't know yet. But there is definitely a need and a desire for something like AM talk radio, but in the preparedness and homesteading frame of mind. So keep an eye out for the workshop radio, the soundtrack to getting shit done. So with that, guys... Let's jump into the conversation I had with Jake. He talks about two things I'd never really heard talked about before, but the importance of learning how to properly assess someone over the long term and the importance of nursing care, the non-sexy stuff that nurses have to do in a long-term grid down scenario. So with that, let's jump into my conversation with Jake Drum of Drum Emergency Solutions. To push. I sure do. <laughs> I'm good at pushing buttons. Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. We are back. I know it's been a busy day. We just finished up a 24 hour radio live stream, but this evening I got a great one. I got uh, Jake Drum from Drum what Drum Emergency Solutions, right? You got it. Right on. So how are you, Jake? Doing great. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Yes, you too. You had a good Christmas? It was fantastic. Yeah, got <laughs> froze and then got thawed. <laughs> yeah, so we got we were talking a little in the uh the pre-show, but you got down to is it minus two? Yeah, about minus two. We had some 28 below wind chill, um, which was fun and exciting in the mountains here in Tennessee, but it's warm now and uh back in the sunshine. Well, I uh last time I saw you it was much sunnier than what we have up here, but <laughs> for those who uh well anyway, I met Jake at Prepper Camp. We were kind of kitty corner neighbors you were up a little bit from me and uh we chatted quite a bit and kind of hit it off and i thought it'd be really nice to have you on yeah i appreciate that happy to be here yeah so let's start i always love to start way back wherever you know (laughs) so where did jake come from you know where where'd you get started with and i always love to ask but what was your very first kind of job your first paying job where'd you start with that delivered newspapers (sighs) i did that too how'd how'd that work out for you (laughs) It was good. That uh, that was way back when in northern Indiana. I grew up just uh, sort of southwest of Lake Michigan on the Michigan state line. And, you know, wintertime there is probably a lot of fun like wintertime at your house. 
So That's delivering really papers cool. in the dark in the morning when it's blowing a gale and freezing rain is just a load of fun when you're making like 50 cents an hour. It's Lots nowadays the last, what the hell's a newspaper, right? Yeah, no, you're totally right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, newspaper delivery. That's what I did first. Nice. So you started out in Indiana and how did you, how'd you end up down in, well, where you are now? You can tell people where you're at. Yeah. So now, um, family and I were down in East Tennessee, Johnson City specifically. We've been down here a good long time, about 16 years. Uh, got family from down this way. Um, so it was kind of a interesting cosmic move, you know, to <laughs> yeah. end up back where family left a while back. Uh, but born and raised in Indiana, in Northern Indiana, um, you know, just kind of a normal Midwestern country kid, nothing too spectacular. A lot of corn and soybeans in Indiana, if you don't know. And uh, so, you know, been uh, around the country, lived in several different states, worked EMS in all of those states. Um, so long, strange trip, as they say, is what it's been. So how did you, so um, how many years did you do in uh, EMS over over the, the term? So I've been in EMS since 1996 that okay. uh, actually started at the sheriff's office, you know, got a job in the jail. That's what you do down here in the United States. In many states, you work in the jail, kind of work your way up, you know, get your street job. That was uh, my initial path. Um, I got over that pretty quick and just through a fluke, got involved in EMS, went to an EMT class, um, started working for a volunteer agency in town where i grew up and uh advanced dmt paramedic um and then i've flown and done critical care stuff and everything under the sun really there's not too many um domestic side paramedic jobs that i haven't done so it's been a very interesting experience I've done those jobs in indiana wisconsin california and tennessee and uh last few years been traveling around doing some training with some kind of paramedic associated programs as well. So um, there's been a lot there that I've got the chance to experience and very blessed to have had those opportunities. Where did you, uh, where were you stationed in Wisconsin? Uh, we were in La Crosse. So okay. uh, we actually lived in Holman, but uh, worked out of La Crosse. We were there for three years. Um, just sort of a pit stop. My mom had gotten sick. That's what drew us out of Northern California. Um, you know, who knows how the path would have gone um, had that not happened, but moved a little closer back to home and on to Tennessee from Wisconsin. So it was it was a much warmer move. So did I read right somewhere that you you're doing mostly instructing now on the EMS level or are you out of EMS kind of all together? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I still have a job at a little county south of here, pull a shift every now and again. Um I'm not really involved on the operational side much anymore. And I've really been out of it for a long time. I left EMS full-time in 2012. Okay. That's when we came down here to Tennessee. Um, 2007, I'm sorry, is when we came to Tennessee. That's when I left EMS. So, you know, all the dates run together when you get old. Um, so I know I, I, I've been out of the working for a long, long time, uh, but, when I left EMS, I took a job in Tennessee uh, as a program manager at the medical school here in Johnson City. So for 14 years, I ran that program, did a lot of graduate medical education instruction. So, you know, that's medical students, residents, continuing education for physicians, that sort of thing. Um, and then that has branched into other educational type opportunities. And that, that really is where the business spawned from as well. And it's a family business. I remember, I think you told me that. Yep. Did you? Yeah. Is it your son or sons or? Yeah. So son, my son, Reese, um, he helps me the most. Um, it really got started looking for a solution for my wife. She works at local elementary school here and uh, just looking for a small kit solution for her, for her job, you know, stop the bleed kind of stuff. It was about the time that the Stop the Bleed initiative movement, whatever you want to call it, uh, began here in the United States. And so, you know, I was basically building a little kit for her. 
and uh, everything sort of started there. And so from that first little kit um, and then, you know, becoming involved with some of the manufacturers for those things, you know, getting to know people, getting out at the trade shows, it just sort of took on a life of its own. So how'd you end up at Prepper Camp? Was that your first time there or had you been there before? No, first time at Prepper Camp. Um, I actually ended up at Prepper Camp uh from a recommendation a uh, guy by the name of jeff up in ohio that i was at a show down in florida with he told me about it um you know most trade shows conferences and stuff like that i've been focusing on over the years have been law enforcement ems emergency management um you know everything that has to do with school preparedness that was really kind of where my shtick was and where i was trying the space i was trying to work in so, you know, I was going to tons of shows for school resource officers and emergency management and all of this stuff. So over time and really kind of through the pandemic, you know, sitting around gaming out different things, um, you know, I was, you know, small business guy, you're always looking for your niche, right? So Absolutely. you're like, all right, Nothing where wrong. do I fit? Where's the, the underserved community? And law enforcement, emergency management, fire, all that, very saturated uh, with yes. kits and kitting and training and all of that stuff. So, you know, like, well, there had to be other markets out there that we could look at and help. And so, you know, I'm kind of a, my parents were hippies, like we fed ourselves <laughs> out of our, nice. our garden and, you know, there was fishing and hunting and canning. And, you know, for most of my growing up, that's what we ate, you know, there was very little grocery store uh, food purchasing, especially when I was young, because we were freaking poor. And um, so, you know, I've always kind of been into that, been into gardening, been into the whole sort of homestead idea. Um, you know, I like to say that my mom was recycling before recycling was cool. Like, <laughs> you know, we're talking about like the late 70s and early 80s. You know, my mom's trying to find places to recycle plastic and cardboard and all the stuff and recycling did not exist at those times and you know turning compost piles and figuring out how to compost all these things you know all the stuff that's kind of the hot new trend now i'm like i was six years old with a pitchfork turned compost piles i'm like i don't know why everybody's so excited about this <laughs> but so you know that got me thinking about the homesteading crowd obviously the prepper crowd um you know and they're <clears throat> there's so many delineations of these groups in the country, you know, so yes. everybody uses this term prepper or homesteader, like it's kind of an all encompassing label for these groups of people. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. Uh, last couple of years, every kind of preparedness prepper homesteader, you know, show that I've gone to has very distinct, different groups of people at it you know looking to do different things and and uh kind of with completely different plans and outlooks and all of this stuff so i was just like there's nobody else doing this here you know i like to teach stuff i like to teach people who want to take care of themselves so you know maybe this is a place to work that's cool i i've taken over the years uh are you familiar with saint john saint john ambulance at all uh mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I it's, I th yeah. Uh, it was one on the East coast. So I took that two or three times for anybody, you know, it's kind of similar to red cross, but it's very, it's a very vanilla workplace. You know, the, the best excitement you get out of the training was learning how to use a, um, you know, one of those machines, the resuscitate. Whoa, there we go. You still there, Jake? Hey, yeah. We good? Yeah, I okay. think so. Yeah, that was weird. That doesn't usually happen. Sorry, guys. Anyway, <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's the Russians. Yes, it is the Russians. The yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the most excitement I ever got from one of those was you know learning how to use an AED or whatever you know, mm -hmm. uh, which was cool. You know, at the time yeah. when I first took it, I was like, huh, this is really kind of groundbreaking to me. But so anyway, the in the prepper end of things. I, I've always wanted to take a more hands-on, like, um, I, I wouldn't say trauma, but, you know, that sort of thing, like dealing with, well, okay, our tagline here is uh, home maintenance when help isn't around the corner, right? So I've always wanted to take a medical course or medical class 
for kind of when help isn't around the corner. Is that kind of similar to what you do, or at least train a little bit with that? Absolutely. So, you know, as you know, there's um, a wide range of medicine available. You know, there's your kind of normal first aid, you know, American Red Cross, like American Heart Association, kind of very basic first aid stuff. And then there's trauma surgery. And, you know, every kind of angle aspect that you can imagine in between that that spectrum like it's a huge spectrum so really what got me thinking about kind of what i'm doing now is i was involved with a company it was one of the tourniquet companies um they had a couple reps at a show it was a huge prepper show okay. um, and this was probably five or six years ago and so um folks were there they were working the booth they're selling tourniquets you know doing their thing at this prepper show and that's when the whole kind of tourniquet um you know tr like we'll just t triple c sort of trauma medicine uh trauma casualty care concept was sort of becoming mainstream in the united states so they're they're doing their thing and so they they talked to this guy and he's you know i mean this always seems so strange to me because the guys at a prepper show, I'm sure he had like a bunker and like a million guns and 10,000 <laughs> rounds of ammunition, you know? And he's like, well, if shit hits the fan and I need a tourniquet, there's nobody to fix me. So what, what good does it do anyway? Like, he's just, you know, you're going to put on the tourniquet and that's going to prolong, you know, your life just so you can be miserable a little bit longer, but you're still going to die. Like, well, why are you stockpiling food and ammo and, freaking seeds and all this other crap i mean you have all of these other risks you know if you're kind of this prepper minded person you have all these other risks all these other threats to all of these preps that you're doing so if that's your attitude about medicine i'm not really sure why you're spending money doing anything at all just buy right. a bass boat and go to the lake and not worry about it you know what i mean so yeah. that has always made me think and i always remember that guy making that comment and i'm like it's so true we are out there teaching everybody under the sun how to hold pressure on bleeding how to do chest compressions you know how to administer an epi pen you know all of these kind of initial basic uh, medical care things right to kind of stabilize people for the short term and we are very dependent i mean like life and death dependent on 911 and the emergency medical right. system you know so the emergency department surgery you know the icu all of these things and i mean you sat and listened to my talk so you know my angle you know i'm not the doom and gloom guy i i focus on natural disaster i mean you don't yes. need to look any farther than you know last week in the giant freaking earthquake on you know the north end of the san Andreas fault there off the humboldt coast so there are plenty of opportunities uh, to need to provide medical care to yourself. It doesn't have to be some crazy wild thing. And so, you know, I just felt like there was a need for some education or at least some, um, some thought experiments for people to be like, okay, this thing has happened. This tourniquet has been put on, or we've had this anaphylaxis, or you have this person that's septic with COVID or pneumonia or whatever. And we don't have the hospital. Like, right. you can't go to the ER. Now what? That is a question that no one has addressed, really, in any of these spaces. Law right. enforcement, fire department, you know, home health, like emergency management. No one has had this discussion whatsoever because everybody's like, oh, well, the paramedics are going to come. And then they're going to take you to the hospital, right? Well one of the things that people should have learned from covid is that emergency departments stop working when they are full and overwhelmed there you know we here in johnson city like it's a level one trauma center we had times they didn't close the emergency department but unless you were like legit dying right now you probably weren't getting anybody's attention for a long right. long time so you could go and you could sit and wait right but you were not going to get attention you were certainly not getting stitches you know you were not going to get especially the immediate 
or not immediate, the intermediate care that you might need. Um, you know, and there are plenty of times, not just here in town, but all across the country, places in Canada, all around the world, where hospital systems, <clears throat> you know, the news spins it like some of these were on the verge of collapse. There were hospital systems and hospitals that did collapse. Well, what do you do then? Right. Like, what's the plan? And I mean, you listen to my talk. That's literally my whole talk right there. If that happens, what is your plan? And have you thought about all of these kind of contingencies for your family? And that's everything from, you know, if you have to wean yourself off your high blood pressure medicine or off your psych meds, do you have enough meds? Do you have the knowledge to do that? If you have to determine end of life planning for one of your family members, have you given three seconds thought to that? And the answer is always 100% no. Right. Because no one wants to think about that, which I totally get, right? But the problem is, and, and we see it every day, you got people prepping for every conceivable uh, disaster, catastrophe, end of the world, but no one has given five minutes thought to, well, what am I going to do with my family, you know, from a healthcare standpoint? Um, and so, you know, I'm just out there banging on a pan with a spoon trying to be <laughs> like, hey, you know, somebody should talk about this. So we're, so that, I, okay, my Canadian's going to shine through here for a second. But one thing that I did notice when I first started traveling to the States and coming to these events was, the importance or, um, you know, the, the everydayness of carrying a tourniquet or learning stop the bleed. I have to say north of the border here, it wasn't something I was nearly exposed to as often as, you know, um, which whatever, it's neither here nor there, but I think it's an important thing for everyone to learn. So where does one start with that? Because, I mean, that's something you can learn fairly quick. And you, I mean, because, if you need to apply a tourniquet, I'm guessing there's a good chance the person's going to bleed out within a few minutes. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. You know, a tourniquet is part of a continuum of, of kind of healthcare need that's out there. If you have severe hemorrhage from a limb, an arm, or a leg, you know, a tourniquet is absolutely the path of least resistance and the quickest way to control that bleeding. Um, stop the bleed courses are available around the country. They're available in Canada. For the most part, those courses are free. You can pop in. And nowadays, if you find yourself in a kind of one of those free normal stop the bleed classes, it's about an hour long and it's kind of an awareness level course of, okay, you know, this is what we're trying to do. This is what life-threatening hemorrhage is. You know, here are a few easy steps that if you're this lay person with no medical training, background, whatever, you can do these things. And if someone thunks you in the head with a tourniquet or you find one, <laughs> you know, in the bottom of your purse, this is how you can apply that, right? Um, so, you know, that is a pretty simple concept. Um, I obviously am a huge believer in tourniquets, people having the tourniquet training, using the tourniquet training. But people need to think a little bit bigger. We've done a bit of a disservice in the community to be like, get this tourniquet. Now you can save all of these trauma victims. You know, tourniquets right. work for limb hemorrhage only. So, you know, if somebody's mm -hmm. gushing blood out of their scalp. You can't be putting tourniquets on people's necks. That looks really bad in court, right? Um, so sure. there, there's, there's a, a segment of the population that tourniquets the appropriate care for. And then there's everybody else. Um, and, you know, just throw the United States as a whole under the bus and say that, you know, we tend to take a problem, right? And be like, okay, this is a huge problem. People are bleeding to death. We need to do something. Here's this cork. Throw this cork at this giant hole. <laughs> yep. Fixed it, right? Hyper like focus. This. Correct. So, there are great courses out there. There are lots of dudes all around the country doing very involved, you know, very kind of lay person friendly trauma care courses. Um, you know, kind of the other name that I can throw out there is first care provider. People can look for first care provider courses. Okay. That's a much more robust version of stop the bleed. Um, when I teach a stop the bleed course, it's the first care provider course that I'm providing. And so that just goes a little bit deeper. 
you know, my course runs about four hours. We kind of get into, get into the injury patterns and the bleeding and the techniques and like, okay, you've used your tourniquet. Now what we get into that a little deeper. So I, you know, I went on your website and worked my way through uh, over to your YouTube channel and stuff. Are you still a proponent of the uh, SWAT tourniquet? Yeah, I love the SWAT tee. I carry a SWAT tee every day. Um, you know, also love the the two windless tourniquets that I have in all of my kits or the soft tee wide and the cat tourniquet kind of, you know, top notch in terms of windless tourniquets. So because every, you know, I've, I've interviewed a few different uh, emergency medical people and then I've talked to a bunch, you know, kind of off the record. And of course, everybody has their, their, their pick you know it's like you know when you when you talk to a guy it's like 1911 or glock right so right. you know some guys are cats rats or, or swat right so how did you settle because you're the first guy i've met that likes the swat the swat t tourniquet so uh because other guys i've talked to you know they everybody has their favorite of course but you know most of them tend to like the ones that you have to twist so mm -hmm. why why have you settled on that and um and what's the advantage versus disadvantage of it? Well, so that <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of answers to that question. So, you know, I carry all three of those um, on a regular basis, you know, depending on what I'm doing. So when I'm out at the farm working, you know, one of those three is, is always close at hand. So it's not that I favor one over the other. You know, most days I have a SWAT T in my back pocket. It's not that I feel like the SWAT T is the end all of tourniquets, you know, that is, um, kind of far from what I think my deal is this, uh, when I was a medic, all those years working on the street, you know, people know what ambulances are. They're full of all kinds of stuff, you know, all <laughs> kinds of equipment. We have these huge jump bags. You get out of the side of the truck with a jump bag. You like slip a disc. You're carrying all this crap in the house. You got this back injury just from carrying the crap. I wasn't a huge proponent of that. You know, all those years I worked, there's about six or eight things that I used all the time. And sure. so as much as people want to poke fun at fanny packs, I have my own little red fanny pack. In my little fanny pack, I had those six or eight things that I was using over and over and over again. And most of those things were, you know, kind of, a, a, they weren't unitaskers, like it's a multitasker. So yeah. You think about your freaking Gerber tool, it does how many ever things, right? Well, SWAT T falls into that category. It's a big giant rubber band, right? So there's like a million things you can do with a big giant rubber band. So I guess if you're just in love with the fact of having a stick, and that's the only way that you can have a tourniquet <laughs> is to twist this windlass, those work, no question. Like everybody should have one, right? I like to have something that's going to do a whole bunch of things also. And so, you know, right this moment, if you went out in my truck and you grab my little trauma bag, you would find a soft T wide in there and you'd find a SWAT T. So, you know, works great as a tourniquet, works great as a pressure bandage, works great to tie somebody up. It works great to wrap up your knee when you blow out your ACL. Lots of things that that thing is good for. Endless uses. I mean, and that's why I like it. So, as Alton Brown used to say on the Food Network, you know, no place in the kitchen for a unitasker. And that is uh, kind of how I think about my medical kit. Everything needs to have multiple uses. A, a SWAT T would be a slightly smaller form factor than, say, like a cat's tourniquet as well, would it? Or would it not be much difference? Yeah, I mean, the footprint's a little bit different. It's not that there's a weight difference or anything. I mean, you know all boils down to if you throw that thing in your back pocket, you know, and I think people get a little bit too hung up on this because everybody has lots of pockets. Like there's no reason <laughs> you can't be carrying a cat tourniquet around. There's no right. reason that you can't carry a SWAT T. I guess if you want it to be shaped like a wallet and fit it in your back pocket, then that's where the SWAT T fills that slot. But, you know, it's not, in my opinion, an argument of one better than the other. The facts are that most people who have any of these devices, if you put them in a crisis situation and you needed them to perform with it right now with no forewarning, 
they would fail. And so that's where the real deficit is, has nothing to do with the piece of equipment. You know, there are plenty of other tourniquets out there that I'm not a great fan of. I will not mention names, but I will tell you that, you know, most people buy those things because they've watched a YouTube video and everybody's like, this is the greatest thing ever. And so they get on the website and they buy that stuff and it comes to their house and they play around a little bit with it and they stick it in their kit and like, you know, that's just their thing. And, you know, no one has ever deployed this thing in extremis. And that's the issue. You know, most folks can't think beyond the level of about a kindergartner in extremis. So that's not the time to be, you know, playing with your new flashy toy and learning <laughs> how to use it. But that that's what we do. I mean, that is literally what we do. So, yeah, because today I told you it was a beautiful sunny day here. So what did I do? I hauled my generator out and I ran it looking for problems. You know, I, I run through everything so that I know the process. So what it sounds to me like is you can buy all the shiny gear you want. But if you're what you're saying is the uh, the shortcoming is in the training and knowing how to use it. Hey, that's 100 percent what I'm saying. And, you know, you listen to my talk uh, at Self-Reliance Festival. I really harped on this at um, the Homesteader show that I was at last, you know, I'm like talking to these thousand people and I'm like talking them out of coming to my booth and buying stuff. I'm like, listen, <laughs> I will sell you all the shiny gadgets you want, but that's not what you need. What you need is knowledge and you need to know how to apply these things. You need to know what needs you have. And, you know, that's what I really preach. I mean, I'll sell you all the stuff you want, but that's not what you need. And I'm the first guy to tell you that, you know, first order of business is like, what are your needs? You know, right. is one tourniquet going to do it? Like, are you preparing for yourself? Are you preparing for a family of eight? Like, you know, and then you get all the folks who are all spun up about the fact that, oh, a tourniquet's $30. And so I'm going to buy one and that's, you know, I'm going to go out here and take care of my whole shooting club at this one tourniquet. And I guess if that's what you can afford, that's what you can afford. But, you know, it's crazy. What people need is education and training and like hands-on operational knowledge. Can a person, I, I don't, um, can, can you improvise a tourniquet? Is it possible? Because I, you know, I talk to everyone and some people say, absolutely not. It's not possible. Can, can you use a belt or a t-shirt or rope or is that doable? Belts, belts are miserable tourniquets. You can improvise okay. tourniquets. You go talk to any medic who worked in the first uh, Gulf War, who worked at the beginning of the Afghanistan campaign, cat tourniquets didn't exist. Soft tea tourniquets didn't exist. Those huh. medics were out there building tourniquets. So it was arts and crafts time every single time someone needed a tourniquet. And so these dudes are packing ahead of time. They got their windlasses cut. They got their cravats or whatever they're using for their strap wrapped. You know, you had ranger medics taking ratchet straps off trailers and cutting those down and making tourniquets with ratchet straps, i.e. the ranger ratchet. Guys were out there improvising tourniquets all day long, and those tourniquets were effective. You know, even during Vietnam, the vast majority of tourniquets used were improvised tourniquets. Now, there were some commercial tourniquets at the time, but they were not a widespread thing. Okay. An improvised tourniquet can absolutely work. There have been lots of studies done. The military has done studies. There have been domestic side studies done. The problem is, is that when somebody needs a tourniquet, they need it right now, right? That's not the time to be doing arts and crafts. So <laughs> sure. if you have to like find a stick, find something for your strap, right? Find something to tie down your windlass with once you have it tight like you're trying to do all of that while this person is bleeding all of their blood out onto the street that's not the time you know and that's the whole point of having commercially available devices that have been vetted right that have been proven most of which most of what we have access to have been proven in combat for years and years and years why wouldn't you pay money for that why would you be out there doing arts and crafts when you can simply have a proven device. I mean, it's like trying to put together an AED in the middle of a cardiac arrest. Like, what's the point of that? Right. 
I, so I, yeah. And I love that you say that because we're on the same page there, of course, but I, I'm a huge proponent of that exact thing. Cause I've, I've said before, if you know how to plumb, then, you know, if you have the skills, then you can improvise supplies. But if you have supplies, but no skills, how are you going to fix anything? Right? Correct. <laughs> You're like absolutely that. right. So where does one start? So, you know, I mean, like I said, you know, just about anybody's employer can be talked into taking a, you know, Red Cross, St. John Ambulance, whatever your generic course is. But mm -hmm. say, you know, because like you said, most preppers, you know, we love our guns, we love our bullets, we love, you know, our stuff, but not everybody, you know, if somebody wants to take the next step or the first step of, I would say, I don't want to say off grid, but, you know, help if, or learning how to do medical if help isn't around the corner. Where, where do you start? Well, that is also a very good question. So, <laughs> you know, it depends on how serious you are about it. You know, okay. starting is truly as easy as just hitting the library or hitting Amazon or hitting YouTube or whatever and getting some books and reading. So, you know, way back when I was in school for paramedic, I had a job in the ER, worked at the little desk and triage. I'd pop down to the library in the hospital was in the basement, I'd grab an emergency medicine book and sit there all day and read chapters in the emergency medicine book. Like anybody can do that. So, you know, if you go to the library and you get your hands on a, a Tittenalli emergency medicine book, you know, it's about this thick, right? Huge, gigantic book. It's written in English. Like if you can <laughs> read English, you can sit there and read about emergency medicine to your heart's content. You can get on Amazon and you can order that book right now and sit around in front of your fireplace and read about emergency medicine to your heart's content. And when you come across something that you don't understand, you hop on your little magic box, right? And get this thing right here. Yep. Hello, Google. Like, what does this word mean? Like truly anyone who is motivated can teach themselves a great deal of information. So Huh. You know, if you're a self-directed person who knows how to read and has a little bit of time to invest, it's as easy as that. Like, it doesn't have to cost any money. Every single library has emergency medicine books. So that can be done. So, you know, other things, like, I think that EMT classes should be taught in high school. Like, hmm. I almost feel like everybody should have to take some sort of first responder EMT class. Um, <clears throat> that gets a little, you know, kind of like socialist, fascist, you know, kind of controlling, but seriously, there's no reason everyone shouldn't have some higher level of training. CPR and AED is great, but wouldn't it be nice if everyone had some firm idea of what to do in an actual emergency, right? And had some information. Right. So, you know, there are EMT classes out there all over the United States, all over Canada. Anybody can take an EMT class. A lot of places now have EMT classes online. Sometimes you just show up a couple weekends through the duration of that course and you do your hands-on and skills. There's a cost, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go take an EMT class. You don't have to take the testing at the end to get your licensure, right? Like community colleges all over this continent teach emergency medical technician you can mm -hmm. sign up and take that class right wilderness first responder that's mm -hmm. one of the things i teach you know a true wilderness first responder class which is about 84 hours is if you took an emt class and you put it in a saucepan and you cooked it down and made you know a super thick you know, savory sauce, that's really what a good wilderness first responder class is, is a, a very cooked down, condensed EMT class. And so for 700 bucks, you can usually do a little bit of online work and show up for three or four days, do all the hands on and get your wilderness first responder, right? So there are cost effective ways with time commitments that most people can, you know, commit to. Mm -hmm. to get a basic level of information that's going to put them light years ahead of things like stop the bleed and first care providers. So if they're truly worried about taking care of kind of a wide spectrum of medical issues, that's a place to start. Now, that doesn't solve your problem if you're 
wife is septic and you don't have a hospital to take her to, and you're going to have to take care of her for three weeks. Right. That's a, that's a whole different monster. Um, but you got to start somewhere. So um, let's slide back to books quick and then we'll go back to the septic idea. Um, do you, if there's a few books, because, you know, if, if somebody wants to have a few at home in their library, any certain ones that you either recommend or have gone through that would be particular beneficial to the preparedness community? Yeah. So the, there's, um, hold that thought for one second. Yep. <laughs> So for those on the audio, I'll do a voiceover at the moment, but Jake, I'm going to guess, is going to his library and uh, picking up some, uh, some books. But, you know, that's one thing us as preppers love is shit or stuff. And that's the thing, you know, if, if you bug out, you can take absolutely all the skills with you that you would ever need. But if you bug out, you're absolutely limited to you know, maybe a few books or, you know, maybe a Rubbermaid tote full of books if you're bugging out with your vehicle. So that's the thing. That's what I love about these skills. And you guys have heard me talk a bunch about wanting to go to the next level with a few of these things. And I think for me, probably the the wilderness, uh, not wilderness survival, but wilderness, a first aid type course might be the way that I would uh, first first approach it for sure. So but uh, yeah, so would, would you bring us back for some uh, reading material there, Jake? All right. So this is the Bible. Wilderness so, Medicine by Wilderness Paul. Wilderness Medicine. And you can see. Wow. Put that by my face. So that is uh, not light reading. No. But this is a great book. Um, you know, it kind of covers down on many issues you may encounter. And many you might not encounter. This is a newer edition of the book that I used to sit and read all the time. See if it'll Just focus. Focus. There, there we go. go. Emergency Kinda. medicine. That's weird. It won't focus on that. That's okay. Emergency medicine. Is that just like a, a textbook or was that assembled? Is there an author attached to that? Oh, yeah. There's an author. So, okay. It's uh, T I N T I N A L L I. Cincinnati. Okay. That bad boy has pretty much everything you need to whet your appetite. So, you know, and that's not to diminish things like <clears throat> just an EMT textbook or a paramedic textbook. And so, you know, if someone's kind of on like a tight, tight budget, like seriously, the library has many of these things. And I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to find a library that didn't have an emergency medicine textbook of some kind, um, whether it's paramedic, basic EMT, that's a great place to start. You know, a basic EMT class is really written at about the eighth grade level. So, <laughs> you know, this is not to pick on anybody, but some of this stuff gets deep real fast. So it's nice to kind of have a primer that, you know, sort of, eases you into it a little bit right so you don't have to look up every other word on google while you're trying to read a chapter what about uh youtube channels is there any particular creators that you're fond of i'll tell you about the only thing i watch on youtube is homesteading videos and the weather um, okay you know i don't watch um honestly anything uh about the only person I could give a shout out to that I on the regular listen to their stuff is Fieldcraft Survival. Okay. Those guys know what's up. <clears throat> what they're preaching out there is excellent. Um, the other guys that I would kind of point folks to is ProlongedFieldCare.org. So the Prolonged Field Care podcast. Okay. Dudes behind that are excellent. They're all very, very, very experienced special operations paramedics. Um, there's a lot of excellent information there. They do a lot of good podcasts. Be forewarned with the Prolonged Field Care podcast. Most of that information, most of the topics that are covered really comes from the angle of someone already knowing kind of what's going on, um, you know, medicine-wise. So um, that's not to say it's not a good resource, though, right? So... 
you get on there, find something you're interested in, listen to it. And so nice thing about the prolonged field care podcast is they're going to cover topics. They're going to talk about issues. They're going to go over, you know, and talk about cases where medics have taken care of patients for, you know, between 24 hours and, you know, sometimes a couple weeks. Right. Kind of in austere environments and manage the problems that those guys have, you know, and that, that really is where your mindset should be when you're thinking about, you know, preparing for medical contingencies on the prepping side of things. So, you know, something like, um, like Chris Dixon mentioned it earlier in here, but something like the, um, St. John ambulance or red cross, they're basically, you know, a, a step up from calling 911. So, you know, they might help you for a couple of minutes or a few minutes. And how, um, what kind of term of care does a course like the wilderness survival course look at? Like how long would you be expected to look after somebody with that training? That's kind of all over the map. I mean, okay. and that's so situation dependent, you know, and I would argue that even if you have your CPR training from St. John's ambulance, you know, you have a blizzard, the ambulance is not going to be there right away. Right. You know, you're going to be doing CPR for a while if you choose to do that. So even we talk about the very basic things, you know, I have absolutely responded to calls before where CPR has been ongoing for over an hour before we got there. Wow. Right now, there wasn't a good outcome, but the people who were there still stayed engaged and provided that basic care. So, you know, it's not about kind of the complexity of the skill that has no correlation to the amount of time that you may do it. Right. Okay. So uh, people get in bad spots. I mean, we just had people freezing to death in cars six minutes from their house in Buffalo, New York. Right. Like who, who, who thinks that that's like reasonable, like that is completely unreasonable, but it's happening it happens all the time. You know, last year we had the blizzard there in Virginia on the turnpike on 95. You're like in the middle of as, an urban, as urban of an area as you can be in. And you have people freezing to death in their cars on I-95. Right. Like who in the world would <laughs> think that that would happen? So, you know, the amount of time that you're going to have to provide care, I don't think has any correlation with the level of need required by the emergency. So when you think about a basic EMT class, like if you go take a basic EMT class, mm -hmm. that class is going to be taught from the angle that you're 911, you're 911, you're going and taking care of this person and you're going to be transporting them to some definitive care, i.e. the emergency department. So, you know, depending on where you are, that's between five minutes and an hour in most places. Right? Sure. Whereas a wilderness medicine class same information, except you're considering evacuation for that casualty. You're considering things like exposure, nutrition, all of those okay. things, because it might take you some time to get out of the back country. Like it might be on you to find your way out for three days before, you know, you can get cell service or whatever to get to help. So, you know, each class is going to approach the same topics from a different angle. But the only thing that really changes is how, you know, kind of the pathology of that disease process that you're dealing with, whether it's trauma, sepsis, snake bite, you know, how that progresses. And then what kind of your environment imposes upon you. So, you know, if you're in the canyon lands out west, what do you have to deal with? Is it hot during the day and freezing cold at night? Like, is there water? Is there not water? All of these things, right? That's completely different than being kind of trapped in the middle of a city where the power is out and there's two feet of snow on the ground and you can't get out of your building. Like, you have different problems. Absolutely. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's really oh, where yeah. the consideration comes from is, you know, what environment are you in? You know, because sometimes it doesn't matter if the hospital is 15 minutes away because right. it might take you six hours to find your way there. So then the, I mean, we've obviously talked about it, but the having a base of skills and then continuing to build on those skills would probably be your best because 
uh, I guess kind of reading between the lines, I mean, the more skills you have, hopefully the longer or depending on what the scenario is, the longer you could take care of somebody. Or like you said, I mean, you could be a 15 minute drive from a hospital, but we could be in a situation like COVID where you might go and you could have no, you know, um, there's just no way for any help. So right. is that, um, I, I guess triage isn't the proper word, but where how, how does one kind of develop the skills about dealing with the stuff that maybe you would necessarily go to the eMERGE for? But in this instance, you can't. So, you know, strong assessment skills, and it doesn't matter what kind of medicine class you go to. And if you would have showed up at our program at the medical school for all those years, you would have heard us harping and harping and harping and harping constantly like we're a broken record about <laughs> assessment, reassessment, assessment, reassessment. And all that means is that you get a good baseline assessment of your patient. You know, what do they look like? How are they? Are they sick or not sick? And that's literally a decision that in all levels of medicine, you make students learn, make them decide sick or not sick. I mean, that's it. And so you do that through your assessment, you know, being able to get a pulse, being able to get a blood pressure, being able to get a good respiratory rate, being able to assess oh. some lung sounds. So basic physical assessment skills, that is a one-off doesn't necessarily mean anything where it becomes important is if you have strong assessment skills you can then start charting some trends right so if you're taking you're in new york during 9 11 and you're hunkered down in the building because stuff's falling down on you right and so you're stuck in this building and you have somebody injured you just taking a decent set of vital signs right and protecting that person from whatever they're exposed to, right? Keeping them comfortable, reassuring them and trending that out. That's going to help you understand if they're getting better or getting worse or maybe just maintaining, right? Which is important, right? And that helps you decide what your next course of action is. If that trend is clearly pointing at the fact that they're deteriorating rapidly, well, you need to like get moving on your evacuation plan because your clock is ticking. Well, if they're maintaining, they're get, not getting any worse, everything's going okay, that's a good thing to know too. Maybe we can find a different evacuation plan that's a little less taxing, a little less dangerous, right? So, you know, these are the things that I would really recommend people learn how to do, like basic assessment skills, understanding how to document those and trend those out. Even if you're taking care of your sick granny at home, right? And you don't want to take her to the hospital because COVID's there and you're worried about her. Well, for the next 12 hours while you're babysitting her, you should be checking those vital signs, writing those vital signs down and looking at those trends and then understanding what those trends mean. Because everything changes in different ways, right? Just because your pulse rate goes up does not mean your blood pressure goes up or down with it, right? different directions on different vital signs indicate different disease process. And that's another thing that you learn in a basic EMT class or wilderness first responder class is some of those basic kind of shock states and the different directions that those vital signs are moving in those different shock states. You know, shock kind of gets used as this umbrella term. They're in <laughs> yeah. shock. Okay, great. What does that mean? Right. So shock basically means that you have this compromise of oxygenation of the cells in your body. Right. I mean, that's the most basic definition for shock. OK, well, there's like six different kinds of shock. There's actually more than that, but about six different kinds that they name that cause that to happen just different ways. Cardiogenic shock, neurogenic shock and hypovolemic shock and all of these different shocks, which are causing the same problem, but have very different pathologies. So understanding how those trends work, right, with those different pathologies really helps you make a decision. Do we need to, like, brave the blizzard on the right. homemade snowmobile to, like, take Granny overland, right, in the raging blizzard to get her to the ER? Or can we wait till the morning? Tell us, you know what I mean? So it's just having good information. I don't think I've ever heard it put that way. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever heard anyone discuss the importance of being 
proper or good at assessing someone. What uh, what are the basic things that you would look for? Because, okay, what are the basic things? And then how often would you do an assessment for trending? So <clears throat> let's talk about the time first. Yes. It's all this sick or not sick question, right? Generally mm -hmm. speaking, even your regular person off the street can look at somebody and be like, oh, damn, they're sick. Or, yeah, you know, maybe you don't feel good, right? And that's really what it is. So a lot of this <clears throat> initial kind of visual assessment is how does that person look, sure. right? Like people shouldn't be gray. You see somebody, their skin looks gray, something's wrong, right? Their skin looks blue or cyanotic, something's wrong. They're bright red, something's wrong. You know, the way people breathe, the way people hold their posture, are they like just obscenely sweaty, all of these things, right? Are they super agitated? All these visual cues kind of help you determine sick or not sick. And so, you know, if you have someone that's sick, depending on how sick they are, you're talking about reassessing vital signs between five and 15 minutes, and that's okay. ongoing. So, you know, if you go out there and you're working in the garage and you fall off a ladder, right, and you crack your skull and you get flown to the level one trauma center, initially, they're going to be getting vitals on you at least every five minutes, okay. right? And they're going to have the little machine hooked up to you. And then they're going to start looking at those trends, right? So stabbing, gunshot wound, you know, you got mauled by a pack of wild dogs, all the same. Initially, we're getting very close, frequent vital signs to watch trends because your condition is unstable. And we want to know before you crash, even if it's like a 30 second notice, right? That that's time that we will use. As care becomes a little more long term, prolonged, chronic, right? Then we start thinking about vital signs every 30 minutes, every hour, right? And then over that time, if trends are going in a way that we don't like, then we increase our vitals as we are adjusting care to the patient, even if that's nothing more than like elevating the patient's legs or trying to get the patient to drink water. You know, vital signs include people peeing. I talk about this in my talk all the time. I'm like, seriously, if you're taking care of someone who is sick and they're not peeing, you have a problem, like a huge, terrible, horrible problem. Like people need to pee. If your kidneys are working and you're peeing on the regular, that's a great sign. Okay. If you are not peeing, that is a very bad sign, right? Okay. So people think about pulse rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate as vital signs, urine output, major vital sign, especially when we talk about taking care of people over time. So this idea of prolonged field care. So there's a lot of that stuff being up to speed kind of on what those things are. You know, a normal, healthy person, we would like to see 100 mLs an hour of pee come out of someone. Okay. Well, if you're taking care of somebody at home, how are we going to do that? Like, how are you going to catch the pee to measure it, right? It's something right. people haven't thought about. So if you're taking care of someone for two days, it's good to know. Because if they can't tell you, if they can't go sit on the toilet and like pee and be like, yes, I peed a lot. There was like three drips. If they can't provide that feedback, how do you provide that feedback for them, right? How do you hydrate your patient? How do you get them to drink if they won't drink? You know, people who have fevers, especially prolonged fevers, are notorious for not drinking. Like, they will mm. refuse. Like, you will not fight them and get them to drink anything because having a fever makes you not want to drink. Well, that's bad because when you're septic and you have a fever, you must hydrate or you will die. Right. So there's all this little basic stuff that is seriously like super duper basic. It's stuff we all do automatically when we feel fine. Right. But if you're taking care of someone who's sick, you have to kind of take over that for them. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, as far as time frames go, the sicker you think your patient is, the more frequent you should be taking vital signs. Right. And so the more stable they become, you can back off that time a little bit. You're still watching the trends though, right? And the more information you can gather, pulse rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, 
what color their skin is, what their pupils are doing. Are they peeing? Do they have to poop? Do they have an appetite? Are they drinking? If they are drinking, how much are they drinking? You know, have a good idea of, okay, they had, you know, 300 mLs of water over the last 90 minutes, but they have not peed, right? Well, that tells you something. Or okay. maybe they're like, have this unquenchable thirst and like they're just chugging water, chugging water, chugging water. And every time I turn around, they're peeing the bed. Well, are they diabetic? Is there sugar 800, right? So there's a lot of stuff going on there. And this is what I'm talking about with different shock states, right? It all leads to the same end game, but it manifests in a very different way from a vital sign standpoint. And just understanding those little pictures or those little categories get you a long way to being like, okay, I think this is the problem. And then we can be like, okay, this is the basic care for that problem. And most care is supportive, making sure people are drinking, right? Making sure people have adequate temperature regulation. So there's not an exposure issue, right? They're a temperature that they can maintain, they're comfortable, they're in a position where they can maintain their own airway. Again, it's all the normal stuff that we do every day automatically. You just have to do that for someone. And it becomes hard because no one has to think about it while they're doing it for themselves. So suddenly, if you got to be like, okay, what do I need to be alive? <laughs> now I have to help this person do that. So the, the assessment is a, a good tool for urgency as well to know whether you need to maybe take some more risks like you said and it's time to make a makeshift sled to haul behind the skidoo and take them out whereas if they're maintaining status quo or even possibly improving because i am here's my thing personally i second guess myself a lot if i don't have numbers you know i'll, I'll look at somebody and just say oh maybe they look worse than they did or maybe you know so I like that a lot because if I can quantify something, I can convince myself that I'm making the right decision. But if mm -hmm. I'm just kind of going off by feel or by, ah, you know, they look a little sweaty or, you know, a couple of minutes in, I'm going to start second guessing myself and thinking, I guess it's time to hop in the vehicle, even though it's flooding and let's run them to the hospital for a fever, you know? Yeah. And I mean, that I think is a normal uh, human reaction. We all do that. I mean... You know, my wife has been sick. My kids have been sick. You know, I've been doing this forever. It still gets your heart rate up. Like you want to do something, right? And that's mm -hmm. great as long as there is something to do, um, you know, or some place to go or help is available. You know, like you said in our little kind of pre-talk, you know, I don't ever want to believe that things ever get so bad that there's not an emergency room to go to, that there's not a physician that can assist, you know, if need be. Um, but it can happen for a myriad of reasons. It does happen. You know, it certainly happened in New, in New Orleans with Katrina. It's happened in other right. places with other natural disasters. And so, you know, that can be very scary, especially when it's someone you love or care for that is the sick person, right? Like, you or me, you, you'd lay there and die and just not right. really get that worked up about it. I mean, but when you have to sit there and then watch the person that you care about do that, it's a different ball game. And sometimes there's no good answers. And, uh, you know, I think if you're in a bad situation, um, you know, understanding how to do assessments, understanding, you know, kind of the frequency for the reassessment, believing the information that you're gathering, making yes. a decision, you know, if we're stable or unstable and having that guide your next step, you know, that, that is a critical need. And if folks find themselves without, um, kind of that safety net of emergency medicine, you know, that will be the difference between life and death is being able to provide that. And then being able to provide some higher level care wherever you are, you know, if that's possible. So, you know, uh, a thermometer, obviously a, a blood pressure cuff of some sort. What about an O2 sensor? Uh, are they, is that important if, if it's a breathing issue or? Yeah. You know, 25 bucks, you can hop on Amazon. You mm -hmm. can get yourself a little finger pulse ox. 
indispensable. You know, people just need to understand that, uh, you know, all those tools have limitations. Paul Sox have limitations. Again, with the trending, you know, if you got a Paul Sox that's, you know, super duper cheap, you might start getting some wackadoo numbers. You know, you always want to kind of confirm what the Paul Sox is telling you. So it's going to give you a pulse rate. It's going to give you an oxygen saturation. Mm -hmm. Well, it's reasonable to have your fingers on the pulse while that thing is counting out the pulse for you, right? Because then you can be like, okay, I know this pulse ox is at least reading every beat of the heart. So that's accurate, right? So you're like, okay, pulse ox is saying heart rate of 90. I'm feeling a heart rate of 90. So that makes sense to me. You know, next step is the saturation. You know, pulse ox is saying 99%, but this person is blue right? Clearly that's wrong. Or the person is pink, you know, inside of their, like their gums are pink, around their eyes is pink. They have pink mucous membranes, right? But the Paul Sox is saying 75%. Well, clearly you're not getting a good read on the Paul Sox. So you're always trying to confirm your finding with a secondary finding. Okay. Does that so, make sense? Yeah. So, um, you know, something you can physically measure as opposed to maybe backing it up with something you can physically see right i wanted to ask you jaggy uh he's a former military medic he's in here from scotland and he said uh, pain is a good scale to give you indication and then he said uh, each person's pain tolerance is different so ask them what their pain is between one no pain and 10 worst pain they can imagine you want to comment on that a little oh i completely agree and, um, you know, you can go a little bit deeper than that. Pain definitely has a psychological component. You know, the pain between one and 10 is a good scale to use and it becomes useful again with the trending, right? So you get mm -hmm. your baseline. If someone's talking about that they have pain that's 10 out of a 10, vital sign wise, you should be seeing that as well, right? So, oh, yeah. So, like if I come and, you know, stab you with a pitchfork, you're probably <laughs> going to have some eight to 10 out of 10 pain, right? Well, if your heart rate is 40 and, you know, or 60 and your blood pressure is completely normal and you're telling me that your pain's a 10 out of 10, I need to dig into that a little bit deeper, right? So some of these subjective measures, the pain scale is one of those, especially as a one-off. You know, you're always trying to support that with another finding. So you're like, oh, my pain is an 8 out of a 10. Your heart rate's like 130 and your blood pressure is 190 over, you know, 110. Well, that makes sense, right? You have this pain. Your vital signs reflect that. Like, it makes sense. And so as a trend, then as I'm collecting this information, I can really determine if whatever I'm doing for you is improving your condition or not improving your condition. So if you break your femur and you're laying there and your leg is at a 90 degree angle and you're screaming in pain and you're like, it's a 10 out of 10, it's a 10 out of 10, your heart rate's through the roof. And then we pull traction on your leg and get it all lined up and splinted. And so now those bone ends aren't rubbing around together, right? You're like, oh, the pain's a five out of 10. And now your heart rate is like 110. That jibes, right? That right. makes sense. That fits the narrative um, that we're, we're trying to build there, right? So always make sure all those pieces are working together, right? And supporting each other. Then when you see things that don't support each other, that's when you dig deeper into that part of it. That makes sense. So in, so having two, two forms of confirmation is obviously better than one then, you know, with, if, if someone says, okay, my pain is the worst ever, but their symptoms or their, you know, their vitals say otherwise, either they're not, you know, there's a disconnect there that their brain isn't catching or whatever, or maybe they're, they're not aware of their pain. So then dig a little deeper. Absolutely. And it goes with all things, you know, it it fits with the pain thing, you know, say we're taking care of you, you're mm -hmm. hurt. Somebody checks your blood pressure and they're like, it's 120 over 80. Okay. And this is like the most common thing ever. 
you get new medical providers out there. They put on the blood pressure cuff and miraculously every blood pressure they take is like in this cute little range. And so they're like, Tim's blood pressure is 120 over 80. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I reach over and I pinch your thumb or I pinch your index finger and you have, you know, a cap refill of like five seconds, right? right. That makes me think, okay, either we have some massive vasoconstriction in Tim's hands, like you're cold, right? So maybe you're freezing and I should warm you up or your blood pressure is probably not 120 over 80. Like those two findings don't jive. If you have a blood pressure of 120 over 80 and you're not hypothermic, you should have a great cap refill, two seconds or less. So if I have this prolonged cap refill, but I got somebody telling me that your blood pressure is fantastic, something's going wrong. Like we need to find where the disconnect is. And it's the same thing with the pain. A high pain indication on that scale, which is a very subjective number, right? Because right. there's plenty of people out there that like whack off their foot with an ax and be like, oh, it's a two. Right. Right. Sure. And then you get people who get a paper cut that will like cry. So like that person just said right there. Hunter's X forces as well, or X military. Yeah. So <laughs> you know it's very subjective. Like there are dudes and women for that matter who will be having excruciating pain and never say a word. And there are other people who are having psychological pain that will go on like someone is disemboweling them. Huh. Is since we've spent so much time talking about uh, assessing, is there a course that deals with assessment or, or just learning the skills of assessing, or is that just kind of a step in the right direction? I mean, if you go to nursing or medical school, there are courses inside of those programs that are assessment courses, you know, EMT class, paramedic classes, even first care provider and stop the bleed have assessment components for what it's worth a basic cpr class technically has an assessment component sure but again like every video known to man is on youtube so just about every medical school in the country has many of their training videos oh. on youtube yep. so you want to learn about physician level assessment go watch some videos and then find somebody that will let you touch them and practice and that's literally the best thing you can do. You know, got a girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, special friend, don't know what they are, friend, whatever kind of friend they are. If they're down with you, like assessing them, do it. Like that is how you learn. And so you go to nursing school, you go to medical school, you don't stand at kids are also great for it. You don't stand around and talk about assessment. Like one of the other students or one of the standardized patients hops up on the table and everybody gets busy. You know, one of the things all through my time at the medical school, all the teaching that I do now, the point I try to make to people who are starting out as lay providers is this, and I'm sure this is the same in Canada as it is in the United States. It's the question I ask. I'm like, what two lessons have you been taught since your very first day in school? Don't talk to strangers. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what are the oh, two key you, tenets you, of standardized education? Like oh, you go to kindergarten. What right. are two things that you are not supposed to be doing? Oh my God. You put me on the spot. I never get asked these questions. That's really good. The two things that we're never supposed to be doing. Yeah. Oh my God. Don't, <laughs> I was going to say don't touch a hot burner, but that's, uh, um, keep your mouth shut and don't right. touch your neighbor. Right. There you go. Shut up so, and sit still. Shut up and don't touch other people. Like right. that, that is what we are taught. I see. Our, I our get our lives. If you are going to provide any kind of reasonable medical care to anyone, you must, 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 must put your hands on people. And you must, must, must be able to speak and communicate with people. And if you can't do those things, like you can't make yourself get comfortable there, forget it. 
that makes sense. It's similar when I went to tactical response. The first thing they teach you when you're ready to unholster your firearm is to yell stop and yell it loud and forcefully. But that goes against social norms. It makes you uncomfortable. It's something you don't normally do. So I, I can see that where uh, you're, you're right. The two social norms that you're that's beat into your head from the time you're four years old in kindergarten is the things that you have to go against. So again, training, I'm going to guess, is the way to what desensitize yourself to that. That's correct. I mean, you know, you go to paramedic school, you have to learn to uh, do physical exam, you know, and a lot of times you're classmates initially are learning physical exam on other people you know and it's weird and awkward right sure. because not everyone is someone that you look at and you're like hey i really want to touch them well unfortunately for you you do not get to choose your patient right i've had many a patient that i did not want to be in the same vehicle with let alone put my hands on sure right and so too bad you just have, you have to do it, I suppose. It, I mean, this is awful, but I mean, if you're a homesteader or you're raising your own uh, animals for meat, it's similar. I remember the first time that I dispatched a chicken, it was not something I wanted to do and it felt awkward and I almost got sick to my stomach. But each time I did it after that, I didn't love it, but at least I had become uh, set, desensitized to it, or at least, um, you know, I was able to do it because I'd done it before. Right. Well, and the thing that I try to tell people when I talk at the homestead shows and the prepper shows, you know, my talk that you heard gets a little more in depth than the version that you heard. And what I need people and I really want people to understand is that most long term care is nursing care. Like the things that help hmm. people get better and not die are nursing care. And sure. much of nursing care is intimate, hands on, like, involved care, you know? And so, you know, I will tell people they should think about things like, can you maintain eye contact with granny while you are cleaning up granny, right? Like okay. if you are a middle-aged dude, like you or I, right? And you're not a nurse, you've never provided close personal care to anyone. There truly is nothing so intimate as taking care of someone else's needs, right? Especially when they have that kind of family connection, like right. your mom, your mother-in-law, you know, your granny, whatever. Like that is something that is just on a whole different level. So everybody wants to get fixated on the super sexy stuff, like putting on tourniquets and packing wounds and like doing surgical airways. And that's all fine and good, but you know, your buddy over there in Scotland, I'm sure that he knows all about, you know, rectal hydration. Well, think about, it's one thing to sit around in the classroom and teach that. It's a whole nother thing to put a rectal tube in your buddy's freaking rectum and right. then provide hydration for that person that way and then clean them up after they do what is going to happen when you add all that fluid to their colon, right? Much of the fluid gets absorbed but you know other stuff comes out well Fair. if your buddy is so sick that he can't drink and so he needs rectal hydration someone has to care for all of those needs it's not the super sexy stuff only right you got to take care of everybody because you can't leave someone laying around covered in poop like that's not good for them and it's not good for you you got to deal with all those problems and you know if you expect to take care of someone and have them have any chance of long-term survival over any length of time it's that stuff that begins to matter positioning in the bed taking care of skin ulcers that people get you know you can develop a skin ulcer inside of 12 hours just laying in a bed not moving wow and this happens all the time in nursing homes well you can't let that happen and the way you don't let that happen is is you're constantly moving that person you're giving them sponge baths, you're keeping them clean, you're assessing their body to see, okay, is the back of their heels, their hip bones, their butt cheeks, like, are, are we developing hot spots? Do we need to like, you know, 
put some freaking diaper cream or whatever between their butt cheeks because they're getting this rash here. It's all of this stuff, right, that you kind of do for a baby and you don't give it a second thought, but now you have to provide it for your granny who's 78 years old and that shit gets a little awkward. That, that's incredible. I, I don't know. I've listened to a lot of people talk about medicine and emergency medicine and people who would necessarily say they're in the preparedness scheme of things but most people either shy away from long term or i've never heard it put that way that uh you know long term care is basically nursing care and that is man you've got gold there jake <laughs> i mean well, i just want people to understand that you know the cool sexy shit lasts about 5 minutes right and the rest of it not cool not sexy That's... and you know just own it do you, do you do a course specifically on that long-term stuff or, or not really? Um, there's not real, as far as I know, there's at least on the kind of outside of traditional medicine, there is no real course. Right. Um, you know, when you, if you do a really good quality, um, wilderness first responder course they'll get into some of that stuff some of my other courses i teach i touch on those things you know prolonged field care as a concept so caring for a patient outside of a traditional healthcare setting is pretty new not that it hasn't been happening for generations on the military side of the house sure but you know preparing for and delivering that kind of care you know, that's been a thing that's sort of developed over the last 10, 15, 20 years as its own specialty, right? So now there are some prolonged field care courses that these dudes are taking, and they're learning more about nursing care and all of these other more advanced assessment things and trends and, you know, measuring urine outputs and all of this stuff that goes into nursing care. You know, they're learning that stuff as medics. That way, if you're over in the middle of Africa and you got to sit on a dude for two weeks, you know, or even three days, it's not like it's got to be two weeks. Like sure. if you got to sit on a casualty for three days, you're going to be like neck deep in nursing care real, real quick. And so, you know, this is just not something that folks ever consider. They're like, oh, nurses are great. Nurses are cool. You know, that's because they've never had to do the nursing job. Right. right. You really learn then that, hey. You know, there's a lot to this and there's, won't even get into the acronyms today, but, <laughs> you know, beyond the one, you know, my course that I talk about is kind of Hitman. Um, there's a couple other acronyms beyond that one that all of it, um, sheep vomit is one of those that's on my slide. So, you know, the sheep vomit acronym is all nursing care. Okay. And, you know, the acronym kind of fits the fun and excitement of what that is. Like, it, that's pretty much what it is, a sheep vomit. Man, that's, yeah, Chris Dixon just says, uh, he said, that's some good stuff. Definitely a couple things I've never even thought of. And I'm I'm not kidding when I say that, Jake, that I've heard a ton of teaching or a ton of talk on this subject. And I don't know if I've ever even heard the concept of, well, assessment, yes, but not to the, the degree you did, but more so the long-term nursing care. Because like you said, I mean, if you save someone's life, but they're unconscious or unresponsive, well, you've got a whole hell of a lot of nursing and, and taking care of a person for the next few weeks, whether they survive or not, if you're in an austere situation. Right. So where, you know, we've been an hour and 20 minutes. How talk a little bit about how people can find you, where they can find you and kind of, we can wrap up from there, Jake. Yeah. So, um, my email and phone number is all over the website. So that's probably the easiest way, right? So, uh, drum emergency solutions.com is the website. Um, you know, that's the easiest way to track me down much to the chagrin of many of the folks like you that I run into these shows out there. I'm not a huge YouTuber or like social <laughs> media guru by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I do have an Instagram page, you know, that there's some stuff up there. 
used to be a lot more active in that. Um, you know, mostly I like to do it the good old fashioned way, right? Just like this, get on the phone face to face. That's why I like these conferences. You can get out there and talk to a lot of people all at once. Um, everybody's like, all you got to do is spend like an hour a day and like shoot some content with this little camera and upload it to YouTube. I'm like, bro, I'm like out in the mud on this farm, like doing this thing. So I just don't it like I'm trying to do that at the farm too. And I can't even accomplish that. And I'm there all day long. So, uh, <clears throat> email probably about the best way, you know, okay. folks are welcome to hit me up. I'm happy to help. You know, I run classes over here. I travel and do classes. Um, how far do you travel? Uh, so I will say the farthest I have traveled so far was about eight hours. Okay. Where, it, where the travel thing gets uh, to be a bit of a hassle is that obviously traveling is expensive. You know that. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, you know, the courses themselves are not really cost prohibitive. But if I have to come to California and do the course, well, I have to kind of write that into the cost. And so, yeah, you know, right what I really like to do, I'll use a recent course that I taught up in Indianapolis. You know, a guy ran into it, one of these shows that we go to. Um, he's got a business up there. He's got a group of folks. They're all preparedness minded. He got with some of them. He's like, hey, who wants to do this course? There was eight of them. You know, it worked out good. Nice. I kind of went up there, spent a couple days, taught the class. We had a real good time. Everybody won, right? So um, that's kind of how I like to do things. Uh, most of the classes when I go out and teach, you know, I really try and tailor it to the group. Everybody has different needs that they think that they have, right? Sure. And so I encourage people to do a needs assessment. So whether it's your group of families up in your holler and you're kind of all working together cooperatively and you have a little homestead, you know, cooperative going, or it's a bunch of dudes, you know, in an urban area that are kind of hanging out, want to learn more, you know, trauma medicine. I pull different pieces out of different courses, put together something that's specific for the group that I'm talking to. And, uh, just try and get people the information they need and help move them along. And if people are in kind of the East Tennessee area, do you have a facility or a place that people can come to you or are you more of a go to them? Yeah. So we've got a place up on the mountain in Johnson County, Tennessee, do some pretty fun wilderness medicine out there. And, uh, you know, one of the things with this, um, farm I got going on at some point, I plan to do more of a farm homestead medicine kind of course there on the farm. So nice. that's under development and, uh, you know, tractors, post hole diggers, cows are dangerous. And chainsaws. So, chainsaws. So, you know, I hope to offer a course that really kind of focuses on common accidents, injuries, issues on the homestead, heavy equipment, you know, animals, that kind of thing. And, you know, the nice thing is, is that some of that stuff kind of crosses over to animals too. And that's a thing people don't think about is that if you can't call the vet and, you know, there are some solid homesteaders out there that, that are providing medical care for their animals now. Um, but, you know, horses, sheep, cows get sliced on barbed wire. Like, you know, what are you going to do about that? Like, does the animal need sutures? Do they not need sutures? There's all these different kind of considerations there, you know, mule kicks you in the face. What are you going to do about that? I don't know. You might not do much for a little while, but that's yeah. right. Hold ice I, on your face. If um, down the road, once you kind of get that developed a little bit, or if you're up for it, I'd love to have you back again, maybe do more of a deep dive into kind of the homestead medicine end of things because absolutely. Yeah, I would, but uh, no, I, man, this, thank you, Jake. I really appreciate this. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. you having me on. No problem. If you want to hang for just a second, I'll, I can close sure. up and yeah, cool. You can just stay right there, but I'll, uh, there you go. Just skip. Okay. So guys, I hope you appreciated this. Jake was awesome. We went an hour and a half and it felt like it was 10 minutes. Uh, I learned, I don't know. He has a way of teaching and he is, um, he's an intelligent dude who knows his shit for sure. But 
the assessment end of things and the long-term nursing care, something I never thought of. So guys, I appreciate you dropping in. It's been a long weekend. We have had more content in uh, this weekend than we normally do, but thanks for hanging in. Thanks for coming in with your questions and your crowd. And guys, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.